Hi there, folks. How are we all doing today? I hope everybody's having a great Tuesday. Uh, thanks for stopping in the show. As always, we are coming to you from the greatest country in the world, the great Republic of Texas, deep in the heart of the Lone Star State, Dallas, Texas, to be more specifically. If you guys aren't already a subscriber, please consider smashing that subscribe button as well as the like button. That'll really help us out with the algorithms. Uh, also, don't forget to hit that bell icon so you guys don't miss an episode uh, in the future. Um, if you guys are on the go and want to check us out, you can find us on Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, as well as iHeartRadio and Amazon Music at Truth Defender Podcast. Uh, if you love what we do here on the show and you're feeling generous, please consider sharing the show with a friend, family member, or colleague. It would really help us out as well. Uh, any questions for myself or our guests, as well as guests or topic recommendations, you can send those on over to eTruthDefender1776 at gmail.com. We've ran into a bit of an issue over the last few weeks. Um, I've been noticing lately that episodes have been disappearing from our YouTube channel, um, particularly the more, I guess you would say, controversial ones. So pretty much all of the episodes that we've spoken to um, Charlie Robinson have been deleted from YouTube. Uh, we had an episode pretty early on with James Corbett. Um, we are talking about 9-11. Um, and all the episodes where we were speaking with Bishop Larry Gators as well, those have all been removed from YouTube. Um, I noticed that there's been kind of a retroactive, I guess, purging of episodes on YouTube lately. Um, so we didn't get any kind of strikes or community guideline violations or anything like that. They just are gone. <laughs> so if you guys want to go back and watch those episodes, you can find those on our Rumble channel as well. So everything that's on YouTube is on Rumble. Um, Spotify and all that kind of stuff. So I'll have a list of the episodes that are missing. I think there's about six or seven of them. Um, I'll list which ones those were in, uh, in the show notes down below. So you guys have a chance to go back and take a look at those as well. Uh, it's unfortunate, but we're getting closer to the elections and they're trying to go back and retroactively get rid of a lot of stuff. So a lot of those episodes as well were kind of, especially the ones with Charlie Robinson, um, a lot of like vaccine related kind of stuff. And so you can only imagine how that went over. Um, but yeah, anyways, we'll get over that. And you guys can check us out on Rumble, like I mentioned, or Spotify. Um, but to the topic at hand, um, we actually going to be speaking again with a returning guest. Um, we had our guest back on episode 10, which is another episode that did not get removed. So that episode's still up there. Um, there might be a chance for that in the future. Maybe they'll come back and get rid of this one as well. So hopefully not, but we'll keep our fingers crossed. Um, so uh, Mr. Leo Zagami has written over a dozen books, including the bestseller Pope Francis, The Last Pope, released in the U.S. by CC Publishing in 2019. Uh, Mr. Zagami moved to Palm Springs, California with his wife, Christy, who runs Cursum Perficio Publishing House to avoid political and religious persecution in Europe. Uh, this book, like Volume 4, Volume 5, Volume 6.66, Volume 7, and Volume 9, was written in English language and not translated from Italian like previous books. Volume 10 is the result of almost three decades of research, personal experience, and studies conducted by the author in Europe, Russia, the Middle East, and Turkey. Uh, this is his first book published as a recently naturalized American citizen, so congratulations for that. Uh, you can find all of Leo's work at leozagami.com or on Gab at Real Leo Zagami. Uh, so without further ado, Senora, how are you doing today? Great. Thank you for having me on, Paul. I guess that in Texas is just as hot as here, uh, probably very humid. And <laughs> yeah. uh, in, in this heat wave, uh, uh, demanding for some truth, because I mean, with all this heat, maybe we can manifest some truth uh, also. And uh, today we have, of course, uh, a very controversial topic to discuss, because as you know, this is the first book in which I also uh, reveal my uh, past experiences and also the history of Islam, its secret societies, and uh, ultimately Islamic Freemasonry. So, uh, I guess you have uh, prepared uh, for this interview, so I leave it to you for the questions, uh, and I'm very much looking forward. Absolutely. Yeah, I appreciate you taking the time to come on. Um, yeah, absolutely. So this is, like you said, a very controversial topic. I'm sure we're going to get a lot of pushback on this one, but um, admittedly, I mean, I actually have the book. I have it 
on Kindle. So I've been starting from the beginning all the way up. So I'll get a chance to finish the book here soon. <laughs> um, but I mean, for a lot of people that, I mean, I know of your work for many years. I follow you for many, many years. Uh, I have a lot of your books as well. So I'm very familiar with all the work that you do. Um, for a lot of people that don't really have a kind of understanding of who you are and why you're, I guess, I guess they want to know like why you are so like why you're the authority to speak on such topics. Can you kind of give like a little, little breakdown of why you're, I guess, uniquely positioned to speak on these things? Okay. Briefly, I started, as you know, uh, almost a decade ago, publishing my Illuminati confessions. I actually started publishing them in the English language uh, almost a decade ago, but I started previously publishing them in Japan, then after in Italy. And these books are uh, a mix, a little bit between an essay and a, uh, and a bio, because there is also personal elements that come from my past experiences within the New World Order uh, as a member uh, of uh, the Italian and the English aristocracy. I was uh, initiated in certain groups and also into Freemasonry. And uh, my experience uh, ended uh, uh, when I actually discovered that uh, all this uh, reality was, uh, was no good and it was uh, also corrupt. Uh, I mean, I thought maybe initially uh, we could fix things from within. Uh, between 2003 and 2006, I fought an internal battle amongst certain secret societies and Freemasonry, but it, uh, ultimately I ended up uh, uh, com coming out of this uh, with a disclosure uh, project uh, which uh, was launched in the fall of 2006 called Confessions of an Illuminati. And later on, like I said, I started publishing books when I also saw that the internet was already starting to become a place of censorship. And at the same time, the attention span on the internet is uh, never more than a page or so, and you can do as many videos as you like, but when you actually publish a book and you uh, manage to uh, manifest all the evidence you have and all the work you have done uh, with serious sources, with, uh, uh, with photographic testimony, with uh, uh, documents, internal documents, well, that makes it a little bit more, more uh, important. And that's why when you ask me why I'm an authority, I mean, you are, of course, yourself calling me an authority. I uh, think of myself as somebody who, uh, from uh, 2006 onwards, uh, has been coming out of a reality, uh, which, of course, I could have stayed in and will have probably uh, given me a lot of... Uh, economic opportunities, uh, fame, success, uh, without having all the problems that came with it. Because once I started this exposure work, uh, I was accused of espionage in Norway. I was then uh, forced to go back to Italy. In Italy, uh, I uh, published eventually these books, but they got me in, in a lot of trouble when I started to become also very political about it when I actually manifested the content of the book also with a protest called the Pitchforks Revolution, which went on between 2013 to the early 2014. So I was arrested, tortured, and eventually I was forced out of Italy after also my involvement as president of Italians for Trump, which was a very important organization that was founded after Alex Jones came to Rome in 2015, and uh, together with uh, my friend Gianmario Ferramonti and other people, uh, including Antonio Maria Rinaldi, who became after a, a European parliamentary, we founded uh, this uh, organization in support of Trump's election, even during the primary. So he wasn't even yet the candidate, uh, but uh, we decided to support him. And later on, when he took his off, we were the only organization abroad that uh, set up this uh, incredible events uh, in front of the American embassy in Rome, in front of the Italian parliament in a great uh, building. And of course, they received the praise of people like Steve Bannon and many others around the world who uh, saw that uh, we were doing uh, an incredible job also with the Italo-American community here in the United States. But like I said, 
I was eventually forced outside the United uh, outside of Italy here in the United States. I arrived in 2019 as a, almost a refugee, but a refugee, a real political refugee, not a refugee like the ones that you see. And I legally uh, wanted to, uh, of course, obtain this citizenship, which I finally uh, obtained this year. Uh, and, and this, uh, of course, uh, um, came along uh, also with. Uh, uh, this uh, book uh, that I started to write last year, but uh, I was still Italian when I was writing it, but I already knew I was here in America, so I, I was free from uh, the from uh, the impositions of uh, living in a place like Europe, which is uh, starting to become more and more uh, uh, invaded and uh, by Islamic uh, uh, migrants, which of course, together with the governments, which are extremely corrupt in Europe, uh, the European technocrats of Brussels uh, are forcing, uh, showering down our throats of this Islamic uh, BS. And, and so you can't criticize it. If you criticize it these days, uh, you will uh, end up in trouble yourself with the authorities. So I don't think I could have been able to actually publish or uh, write a book like this uh, uh, living in Europe. So I'm very glad that... Uh, this book just came out and then it's my first book as an American citizen because we have this great constitution and we have a great opportunity to still talk freely about a wide range of topics without the police knocking on your door. Something that instead happened to me, unfortunately, in Italy. They literally broke the door a little bit like they did with Roger Stone, mm -hmm. uh, terrorizing my wife and treating us like criminals when we had done nothing wrong. And so this uh, was, of course, one of the negative experiences, but I could, uh, uh, of course, I had also the one where I was accused of espionage in Norway uh, after I uh, basically was involved for a period of time with this Islamic organization that ended up being also involved with the Jesuits. And in this book, for the first time, I really talk about my past involvement with the Islamic faith and why the Illuminati uh, and the Freemasons are so obsessed with this uh, religion. Sure. It's, it's, uh, I find it a little bit, not hilarious, but a little funny that you went from one repressive, repressive part of the world in Europe. And, you know, I know exactly how it's getting a little crazy out there with all the migration, especially like, Sweden it's, it's, it's not country. comparable uh, to, to what is going on here still. Still here, well, you have the freedom of expression, the freedom of actually, uh, you have the First and the Second Amendment that basically you don't have in Europe. You have to understand, countries like Italy have been occupied since 1945. They were defeated in the Second World War. They don't have any rights. The citizens that lives in the, live in these countries have constitutions that are a joke. They call themselves democracies, but they are not <laughs> democracies. They are... Uh, uh, op oppressing people in every way, shape, or form. I could uh, have been arrested if I stayed in Italy because they were uh, sentencing me for what I wrote in my books, for what I was writing in my articles. You don't have lawsuits in Italy. You have a way of silencing authors and journalists uh, immediately uh, through these uh, lawsuits uh, in, that you end up in a criminal court when you write something wrong about somebody in Italy. And, and, and you end up basically in jail for what you write very easily. So this is a way, of course, uh, to censor uh, a lot of people. That's why in the freedom of press, if you go and check out uh, the chart they, they, they do yearly for the freedom of press, Italy is like number 50, 52. That means uh, that uh, it is uh, way below many other countries. We are almost like some kind of a banana republic or African state. And this is almost impossible to conceive for an American because they see the beautiful image of Italy, this, that. You know, it's great to go there as a tourist. It's a great place to go there as a tourist, as well as going to Great Britain. Great Britain, I'm half English, but I will never go and live in a country that is becoming more Orwellian every day, in which people uh, get persecuted. And we have seen Tommy Robinson, uh, how himself uh, had to struggle uh, and, and, and he's still trying to protest against these Muslims. But even if, if you pro protest in, in England, you can't really uh, do anything against them or even uh, act freely 
uh, with a freedom of expression that doesn't exist anymore because they will come there with some psychologist and they will tell you you're crazy and they will probably lock you up in a mental asylum. So this is what happens in Europe. It's not comparable yet, even with the, the present situation with Biden and everything that's going on in the White House. Of course, if Biden wins again, and then we might go further close to the reality that we have in Europe, then uh, I might uh, tell you, yes, uh, it's, we, are lo- we are losing uh, uh, ground here and there is no other place on earth, though, after America to, uh, to, to, to actually fight this war because America is the last country which has these freedoms. There is no other country on earth. For the most part, yeah, it's it's getting kind of it's getting close. I mean, I've seen instances where, just like they do in England, for a lot of people that post like memes online on Twitter, or Facebook, and they have the police that go to their house and they actually get arrested. More than once to, with me in Italy, only for yeah. posting something on Facebook, I got raided. I, I, more than one time, I got uh, the police arriving at nine o'clock in the evening with uh, sirens communicating me that a judge has decided that my Facebook post was offensive to somebody. Or uh, another time, they smashed the door uh, just to tell me that, uh, and, and they actually took me and brought me forcefully away and locked me up for two or three weeks because of what I wrote on Facebook. So, I mean, this is the reality we have in Europe. So this is not yet the reality we have in America. We might have the FBI harassing some people. And of course, what happened with January 6th is an example. But generally speaking, we are still very very far from that reality. I'm not saying that it's it's not possible in the future. I hope not, because that will mean the end of the American dream. That will mean also the end of the United States as we know them. So I hope that we never uh, get to that point. Right. Yeah, it's very odd. It's going to be definitely very interesting to see what happens in these next few months prior to the elections. It's going to be a lot of craziness, I think. Um, But hopefully we come out on the other side something better, but I don't know. It's, but I mean, I won't get too far off topic, but um, I guess we can start kind of for a lot of people like myself as well. I was in the military for many years. Um, I'm very familiar with, I guess what you would call the normal Freemasons. There's a lot of like people in the military that are sure. a lot of people that are in the military. When I was in the military, they were always trying to like recruit new people and like everybody that I knew became a Freemason. Um, a lot of- I had the direct experience once uh, many years ago, it was in 2008, uh, and I was visiting uh, Austin, uh, and they brought me to a military base uh, not far mm-hmm. from there, in which there were some Freemasons that uh, wanted to have a meeting with me. So I, I know exactly what you're talking about. That, of <laughs> course, Freemasonry here in America is uh, a very open reality. There is not much to hide. Uh, it's more of a social club uh, there is of course certain secrets that are typical of the masonic fraternity but there is so many fraternities here in the us it's not like only the freemasons however when you bring freemason in other contexts then things are different right yeah and that's just what i was going to kind of try and see if you can kind of break down you know like i mentioned a lot of people in the military there's a lot of a lot of police a lot of fire department a lot of people like that that a lot of people would see and think well, those guys are not bad. You know, they're doing a lot of great things for the community. And I live down the block from one of the Freemason lodges here. The courthouse downtown was built. You can see like the little symbols on the side of the courthouse. But for a lot of people who don't really understand the difference where where that comes from between the local Freemasons in the neighborhood to things that you actually got into yourself, what's like the kind of breakdown and where does that yeah. kind of divide happen? Well, in Italy, we have uh, a bunch of irregular grand lodges. Everybody knows that aside from the regular Freemason in Italy, you have uh, over 150 Masonic obediences, which are 
uh, not regular, meaning they operate outside of regularity. Masonic regularity is given by the United Grand Lodge of England as a recognition that you are working following the Anderson Constitution. Uh, and I have a great respect for a lot of Freemasons who do this work in an honest way. However, even uh, here in America, certain Grand Lodges, and I'm not talking about the Grand Lodge of Texas because I have some great friends also there, but uh, Grand Lodge of California for me was a disappointment. I mean, we have a former Grand Master who has openly criticized Trump and they shouldn't be talking about uh, religion and uh, politics in their lodges. But then you have also another kind of Freemasonry that in the 1870s uh, parted ways with the regular Freemasonry, which is Grand Orient Freemasonry, born out of the Grand Orient of France, which decided to discuss politics and religion in their lodges. And so it became then uh, this division reflected also on the expansion of Freemasonry in the Middle East. In Egypt, for example, where the British intelligence was trying to create the very basis of what later on will become the Muslim Brotherhood, the Salafi movement and all that, uh, the, the guy who uh, I actually talk about extensively in my book, Jalaleddin al-Afghani, uh, was first welcome in a regular lodge, but even his British controllers, when they saw that he wanted to use Freemasonry for something more, not only as a social or as a... Uh, mystery school to teach certain secrets, they advise him to uh, go under the Grand Orient of France and create his own Grand Lodge, which was very successful, very influential. And so there is all these realities that uh, a regular Freemason will tell you, well, that's not Freemason, it's not regular. And that's the way a regular Freemason kind of washes his hands out of the whole thing and says, oh, I'm fine. But even here in America, because of uh, the reality of segregation at some points, even within Masonic, uh, the Masonic fraternity or other secret societies, the black community, the Afro-American community, created their own irregular realities. Now, um, since the early 90s, uh, uh, because of the United Grand Lodge of England, these realities have re been regularized. But still, to this day, in, uh, in particular in the African uh, uh, American community and also in the Latin American community in the US, there is irregular lodges. Irregular lodges that, for example, like I described in volume eight of my confessions, are involved in the entertainment business, uh, mm -hmm. have uh, actually even been invo involved with the murder of Michael Jackson. So, I mean, uh, this is uh, like just to give you an example, and you can find all this, of course, in volume eight of my confessions. But when it comes down, to uh, Italy. Italy is an even more complex reality because Italy was the place uh, which manifested one of the most uh, scandalous lodges in the history of Freemasonry, which is the Propaganda 2 Lodge of Licio Gelli, which ended up uh, uh, in all the newspapers of the world uh, when a guy was found uh, in London on the Blackfriars Bridge, uh, hanging from the bridge in the early uh, 1980s, and that uh, was a reflection of a scandal that involved the Cosa Nostra Mafia, uh, basically what you see in The Godfather Part Three, the Cosa Nostra, the, the Vatican, and of course Freemasonry. Now, in Godfather Part Three, let's say that the Masonic element was left conveniently out to not sure. give too much, okay? <laughs> but in reality, Freemasonry has been ruling the mobsters for, 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 for since the beginning. Uh, uh, Freemasonry... Uh, uh, developed in different ways in the continent and in the Anglo-Saxon countries. And in the Latin countries, South and Central America, there is a completely different approach to Freemasonry, probably more similarly to Italy than to, than to America, because they are also countries that are heavily influenced by the Jesuits. The Jesuit order rules South America and Central America. And that's why these countries are can I say it? Shitholes. And that's why people come in floods here and invade us, because they, in their countries they can't find a good life. Now, we just saw recently the, the election of a progressive communist president, female president in Mexico, another demonstration that the progressive, because you have to see also another thing. This other form of Freemasonry, which you can see on the internet, is called continental or progressive Freemasonry, that developed from France, 
is very much leftist in nature because uh, it, it, it embraces those socialist ideals that are so popular in South America, Central America. In Cuba, for example, Fidel Castro was a 33 degree Freemason, Che Guevara was a 33 degree Freemason, and all the people that did the revolution, in fact, Freemasonry in Cuba, still to this day, was never touched. It was left there because the Jesuits in the Latin American countries decided to leave Freemason alone and use Freemason because at one point the Jesuits during their history, which spans almost 500 years, they made an alliance with the Freemasonry and the Illuminati to survive because they had been kicked out of the Vatican in the 1770s. So the history of uh, Islamic Freemasonry, of course, reflects also some elements of what's happened here in the West. No? And uh, I uh, explain uh, for the first time how um, in the last three centuries, since uh, the uh, speculative Freemasonry, as we come to know it, uh, which was founded in, uh, in England, evolved, and of course, uh, the two main countries behind colonialism in the Middle East and North Africa were France and England, France and Great Britain. No? And these two countries were Masonic. I mean, France, Fraternité, Galité, Liberté is a Masonic uh, motto before being a French motto. The French Revolution was, of course, a Masonic Revolution. Um, and so when I uh, decided to write this book, uh, uh, I wanted the people to understand that uh, the Freemasons of, uh, of, of Great Britain and France influenced tremendously the outcome of what then became modern Islam. So they started, because of course, Freemason is not a secret society. Let's, let's be open about it. You said it yourself, you find the writings in the street, I think, at the entrance of the, of the towns. You know, for me, it takes two seconds to go and meet a Freemason if I want, because mm -hmm. I know, of course, the modes of recognition, I know everything. So I, I, will, I will go to a town and just go to the lo local lodge and, and introduce myself and it would take me more. So it's not a secret. In other countries, though, it is more secretive. In Italy, where the Catholic Church was uh, always openly against Freemasonry, even if very, if very hypocritical, because then behind the scenes things were very different, Masonry couldn't put their signs openly, couldn't be so open. And the same thing happened partly in South America and Central America, because they were, of course, much under the control of the Catholic Church. So we have today in places like Mexico a variety of grand lodges, regular and irregular. And, 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 and the same thing can be said also for the rest of, of South America. Brazil has, of course, a Grand Orient, which is regular, but then has other obediences, which are irregular. And, and what does it mean, all this? It means that often, though, the regular Freemasons that you see parading officially in the city, when they want to do something a little bit more political, or religious, or uh, they go and work in the regular lodges, even if in theory they shouldn't, because it's prevented by their own constitutions and regulations. So, with the, the spread of Freemasonry as we know it, Islamic Freemasonry started to build up in those countries where, of course, England and France wanted to establish these lodges. Because uh, in the end, uh, initially, their, their plan was to destabilize the Ottoman Empire that had been there for 800 years. Now, they came into contact with the, other, with the various secret societies, mostly Sufis, because uh, they had the same modalities, secretive things uh, that are secretive, uh, led to people who, who share a passion for secret societies will find themselves more easily attracted to each other. So the, the Western mind 
that wanted to politically uh, corrupt the Middle East, uh, first of all, made contact with the secret societies. And this happened both uh, in the French colonies like Algeria, uh, Morocco, and all that, and then later on also uh, in, 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 but also in Egypt, first of all, because Egypt and other places in the Middle East, though, had another particularity that Freemason in reality derives from a tradition that if we go and dig deep and deep, comes from the Middle East. So it was like going back home for Freemasonry. And so even the Muslims who saw the spread of this, uh, of this institution, uh, they, they didn't see it uh, negatively when they understood that they could obtain a lot of benefits from it. So even in Iran, where there was very strict clerics, even back in the back in the days of the of the Shah, not the Pavlavis, but before, the, some of the aristocrats went to Europe and got initiated. And the same thing happened in many other Muslim countries. So the, there was an interaction between Sufis and Freemasonry that uh, built up basically the basis of uh, uh, of a collaboration. And this collaboration in the long run, like I said, led to the, the disappearance of the, uh, the, the implosion, sorry, of the Ottoman Empire. But before even all this, if we go hundreds and hundreds of years back to the Crusades, that's where we get the first alliance between the Western Illuminati and their Middle Eastern counterparts. <laughs> when uh, the Pope decided to inaugurate the Crusades, First of all, they had to embrace a holy war concept which was not Christian in nature. And so it was imported from, from Islam, right. from the Ribat concept of building fortresses to protect the pilgrims, from secret society like the Ashashins, they inspired uh, knighthoods like the Knights Templars because, of course, they were searching inspiration and they didn't have the same kind of thing. So nobody up until the first millennium, the turn of the first millennium had ever fought a holy war within Christianity. They were not interested. Jesus never preached a holy war, never wanted anybody to go and kill for a, you know, let's kill for this cross. Right. It, <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. The guy killed himself so we could all be free. So it didn't make any sense. But with the, the distortion of this concept came the Crusades, and paradoxically, the Crusades were actually inspired by Islam. So Islam today says, oh, the Crusaders, the Crusades were even... Yeah, but you inspired them. <laughs> and it's paradoxical, <laughs> but it's true. So um, in uh, my latest work, uh, which is a completion, of course, of all the work I've done before, because as you know, this is volume 10. I started with volume one, describing my own personal experience, also explaining to the people what, what I intend for the Illuminati, what are the Illuminati for me, which are not only Adam Bishop's uh, Illuminati established in 1776, but Illuminati go back all the way to the uh, Alexandria, to the Gnostics, uh, even to ancient Atlantis. So we go to mystery schools that are much older. So when... Uh, the Westerners brought back Freemasonry in countries like Egypt or Te they were inevitably have to face uh, mystery schools that were much older <laughs> and that were, you know, that actually inspired them maybe originally. Mm -hmm. so what happened here is that in Cairo, where still to this day all the power of the Middle East is balanced. In fact, every time they have to discuss something about Gaza, where do they go? In Cairo, the head of Shimbe, the head of Mossad, the head of the CIA. They all go always in Cairo. They come from Qatar, they go in Cairo. They don't go to Saudi Arabia, they don't go to Iran, they, don't go, they go to Cairo because Cairo is the place which has this very ancient history and we're actually... Freemasonry was practiced even before it arrived and was then formalized, of course, in 1777. We're talking about thousands of years of, of ancient mystery schools and Masonic, if we want to call it Masonic practices, 
I mean, if if you if if we go and see what what Freemasons do in their free degrees, which le lead to your Master Mason degree, that tradition brings you back to Horus, Osiris, uh, uh, Isis. It basically brings you the widow's son. Who is the widow's son? <laughs> Horus, Isis, uh, Osiris was the. So um, we go back to ancient Egypt. So inevitably, when 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 they brought. Uh, Freemasonry there. It was like bringing pizza to the Italians. They knew it. <laughs> right. <laughs> the Egyptians make very good pizza, by the way. Do they? No, no, the, the number one. In fact, most of the pizza makers these days in Italy are Egyptian. Oh. They go, they, they, they are very good. I must admit, they are the only ones who know how to make it. And, and, and you have to know what you're doing when you make a serious pizza. So <laughs> this, <laughs> the Egyptians who have such an ancient tradition um, like I said, simply embraced and made an alliance between the, the new, this new form of speculative Freemasonry that came from the West and the old form of Freemasonry that they themselves established thousands of years before. So this merging of this uh, tradition was, uh, uh, was manifested ultimately uh, with, uh, um, during the Napoleonic presence in Egypt, in which even Napoleon himself wanted to be initiated in the Pyramid of Giza. Uh, and uh, that was the moment in which they started to establish lodges in Egypt. The French established these lodges. Then, of course, later on, the English established more lodges. But the French established a specific kind of lodges. They had uh, established the uh, right of Memphis. Uh, they were all fixated with the Egyptian rites of Freemasonry because the Illuminati, like Cagliostro, had promoted all over Europe Freemasonry as an Egyptian reality, as something that was originated from Egypt. In fact, Cagliostro had founded the, the Egyptian right himself, and then later on his followers founded the Memphis and others founded the Mizraim. And uh, so when these officers of Napoleon arrived in Egypt and they introduced this uh, Egyptian, basically, rights, the Egyptians said, wow, great. Like, I mean, if you want to bring pizza back to the Italians and they find it nice, like with the Egyptians, yeah, it's great. So immediately there was... Uh, like it kind of like came all together and that was the foundation though for like i said earlier what would become later the muslim brotherhood and then in turn from the muslim brotherhood we have al-qaeda hamas uh, isis uh, and all the salafi jihadist groups islam during the time before the English and the French Illuminati and Freemason had come into the Middle Eastern game had been relatively peaceful. Because during the 800 years of Ottoman Empire, what we now call Israel or Palestine, or however you want to call it, they were living in peace. Right. They have arrived to a compromise. Islam, when it first started to expand, demonstrated its weakness by the fact that after the death of Mohammed, it's everybody in his family, his companions argued who is better, that this is better than that. And it en ended up with the Battle of the Camel and ended up basically with the, the cousin of Mohammed who had married his daughter becoming, the, let's say, the inspirator of the Shiite Muslims, which today are a minority faction, but they are still tremendously influential. In fact, they are the ones who lead the clerics of Iran, and they are also in Iraq. So when you go and fight these wars in the Middle East as an American, you don't, basically, you don't know anything about this. And that's why I find really important this book, also for people like you, servicemen, who have done this job. Now, I don't know if you ever did the tours, if you were ever located abroad, uh, Two. Where were where were you? Where were you? Uh, the the Khas province of Afghanistan. Perfect. So, yeah. Okay. Let me tell you one story about Afghanistan. Now, Afghanistan traditionally Sunni is viewed right. as a Sunni country. Okay. Now, when uh, the English uh, wanted to destabilize the Middle East and uh, 
after all these hundreds of years of relative peace, uh, create the basis for what became, unfortunately, Salafi jihadism, which is basically something that was laying dormant for hundreds of years. Huh? Right. They employed a guy called Jamaleddin Al-Afghani. Now, his surname immediately, you know, in Egypt, they saw this guy with a turban who looked like a, like a Taliban. Wow, Al-Afghani. He must be Afghani. He must be Sunni. Right. That was actually a way of tricking the Egyptians, which are Sunni now. In reality, the guy was born in Persia, in Iran, and the guy was Shia. But he was presenting himself because the Sunni world, as you know, nowadays uh, rules Egypt. So right. this already shows you the trickery that is no, in place. And then this guy established one of the most influential lodges in Egypt for 10 years. He was basically ruling the whole place. In the end, they kicked him out, but he didn't just leave and go. This guy was going to the best lodges in Europe. He was guested by the Tsar in Russia, working with Madame Blavatsky's publisher in Russia. He was connected with the Theosophicals. This guy might have wear a turban, might have looked like a guy out of a cave, but don't 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 be fooled by this guy because this guy was an Illuminati and he was going around like the shit, you know, like he was. And so people here in the West don't know these things, don't know that 9-11 was the product of all this, of hundreds and hundreds, because Jamal Eddin al-Afghani had two British handlers. And at the same time, Jamal Eddin al-Afghani was instructed to bring back that jihadism that wasn't the jihadism. I mean, when we talk about jihad, we have two concepts of jihad, and it's one is an external, one is an internal. And if you talk with a Muslim, they're always going to tell you it's a personal struggle and that we misunderstand it. Yeah. Don't be fooled. Don't be fooled because in the end, they all want the Sharia equally, <laughs> the ones that fight internally and externally. So in the end, the result is the same. But in any case, this book is not against Islam. He's simply stating the facts about Islam. And in fact, this book has not been debunked or criticized by anybody at the moment. It has a five-star reviews. It's number one book in Islamic social studies. This book is respected by Islamic scholars because I go by the book. I cited the hadiths. I studied the Quran for many years. I know the Islamic reality behind the Sunni, the Shia, the Ismaili that went from the Shia, the, the Druze, the Alawites, the Alevis, and all these factions, which basically are a headache for a Western man, because they say, who are they? So this goes back to the fact that I was initiated to the highest degrees. And at one point, I was also the Grand Master of the Strict Templar Observance. So I had a direct experience also with Islam that eventually brought me to Egypt, brought me to the Middle East, basically, and, and beyond the Middle East, also to Turkey, with direct experiences with the Sufi groups that ultimately, unfortunately, produced a child, which I never saw again. So this, with, with a descendant of Prophet Muhammad. So these things are, uh, of course, never discussed because everybody is afraid. It's very dangerous to discuss these topics. These people are they cut your throat in a second, in the middle of the night. But mm -hmm. going back to the jihad, you see the jihad. Okay, let's talk about the jihad. Because, you see, in the first two or three centuries of Islam, before the Shia uh, manifested the Fatimid dynasty and eventually the Ismaili Ashashins, the Nizaris, which are specializing in killings, and cutting your throat in the middle of the night and doing things that were not very nightly, they yeah. were the knights like Saladin, even at the time in which the Ashashins operated. The Knights Templars used the Ashashins, they allied with these crooks to do the same thing they did on 9 11. The, the Mohammed Atta, Mohammed Atta is an Egyptian. Where does he come from? Egypt. In fact, if you go to his father, he will tell you, it's all the fault of the Mossad. Yeah, very easy, very simplistic. 
but it's not like that simplistic because behind 9 11 there was bush there was of course the neocons that employed these muslims who were the heirs of the same Ashashins they used to kill their Muslim enemies back then. Because when the Knights Templars and the other Crusaders, I'm talking about the Knights of the Holy Sepulchre, the Knights of Spiderlias, the, the Teutonic Knights, found themselves in the Middle Eastern mess, the Pope was very clever. He said, guys, you have to take advantage of these Muslims. They will fight against each other. Just side, you know, just make them fight because when you, when they fight, dividiet impera, they say the Latin, and of course the Vatican inherits the old Roman tradition. Right. When you make enemies fight, then you can come in and take over the show. So they employed the Ashashins against the Sunni Sergic, uh, the Sejuk Turks that were expanding all over the Middle East. And if you go and see all the assassinations that were carried on by the uh, Nizari Ashashins, it was a hit list of the Knights Templars. They even attempted to kill two times Saladin. The Templars and the Crusaders couldn't be seen as crooks that go and kill and slaughter people in the middle of the night without respecting the rules of war. And that time, the knighthoods, including Saladin and their, his counterparts in the Christian world respected the rules of the war, uh, of engagement. You had swords, you had things, you fought, fought on horses, you were knights, okay? Right. So you couldn't go and do cutthroat kind of stuff. Right. The Shashins, they couldn't give a damn. They will dress up as a woman and show up in the middle of the night and just suddenly slip something in your drink, and then you will, and then you will find yourself dead. That that is a ninja kind of way of asking. <laughs> right. In fact, they dressed up like ninjas. You know, they came mm -hmm. like that. So the Ashashins were not traditional Muslims. They were the product of something else. That something else was Shia Islam, which still to this day is actually inspirational for jihadism. Because people see Hamas and say, but these are Sunni. How comes Iran is backing them and they are Shia? How comes Iran is backing them, but then the backing from, for the money comes from Qatar, which is Wahhabi? Wahhabi is another Salafi operation of the Brits. The Brits managed in the 19th and 20th century to create the basis for present Islamic terrorism. And Islamic terrorism has become simply a tool of the military industrial complex of NATO to trigger wars and to send people to die or in useless setups like Afghanistan, which actually is not very useless. I mean, if Joe Biden was not an idiot, he would have stayed there because now, of course, it's in the hands of China. Russia, which used to be their enemy, because, you know, for, since the 70s, they spent so much money, the CIA, to oppose the Soviet Union. They trained people like Osama bin Laden. They financed the Taliban. And now they went away from Afghanistan, leaving a billion dollars of weapons. The country falls in the hands of the Chinese. And even the Russians, who used to be their enemies, are making deals with the Taliban. So this is insane. And the strategical importance of having an airport just so close to China in a place like <laughs> Afghanistan or military base, I'm talking, of course, a military airport, right. or, or having, in any case, a military presence, it was definitely a strategical, of strategical importance. But if you have sacrificed so many soldiers, you can't go away like a coward and do what Joe Biden has done. And that's that's really, I mean, only for that reason, Biden should get 10% of votes, maybe 5% at the next election, if people were in their sane mind. Because the soldiers of America went and, di and, and died for this, uh, for this uh, Afghanistan, this piece of shit land which has been contested for centuries and has seen every single army of every... Uh, power from Russia to to the to United Kingdom failed. So here in, uh, in this book, I finally explain to the average Joe, starting from chapter one, which explains the origins of Islam and all these divisions, how 
it operates, the, all these divisions operate, and how they interact with the Western Illuminati and the Western Freemasons, and how in the end we came to, 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 to that monstrosity, that mega ritual of 9-11, and how we arrived to the 7th of October with Hamas, and how we are now forced to see these idiots in the universities sponsored yeah. by Soros, Rockefeller and company who are becoming a training ground for, for terrorists in, in, in our own universities, in our own campuses, there is terrorists. Yeah, this is, this no, is, I know. This, this they is have it. organizations for, you know, a lot of the people think that, I mean, obviously the media, there's a lot of propaganda. You, you have a lot of students that were mostly from families with, they're wealthy, obviously. A lot of a lot of a lot of these students go to these Yale and Harvard and these big schools obviously have money. But for them to be on the side of like terrorist groups like Hamas in the streets but, screaming. But let's go back to the big Hamas. campuses that you just mentioned. Who rules right. Yale? Skull and Bone. Uh, Skull yeah, and that's bone. Right. Mm-hmm. Harvard, maybe school and I mean these are campuses of universities which are controlled by secret societies right. and the secret societies know exactly what is happening and are encouraged to act in that way and they go back to the old alliance that we have seen uh, from the uh, for, for, for hundreds of years and, and unfortunately the regular Joe doesn't understand this and so when uh, George W. Bush came out after 9-11. People were crying in this country and believing in this crook who one year later will be meeting with one of the Saudi princes who is involved in the foundation of later on of ISIS and of Al-Qaeda. Guested in Texas. <laughs> right. Well, he lives, they live just around here where I live, right here. Yeah. Absolutely. University Park, they have the Bush libraries and they live right in the center of Dallas, right there in a nice house, a lot of money. Real, real nice. Yeah, yeah, real but, nice. But let's remind people, President Bush right. in August 2002 met with his close friend Prince Bandar bin Sultan, at the time Saudi ambassador of the United States. In my book, of course, I explain who is this crook, who Thanks to his project of uh, uh, basically selling oil for a surplus that could... Basically, what happened was this. Saudi was selling oil to a price that was higher. So with that difference in price, they could finance the terrorists from the 70s onwards. I mean, this is crookery, immense crookery. And people need to wake up because this is... uh, there is hundreds of thousands of people, millions maybe, who have lost their their, their legs, their things. They, they have lost their life. They have given their life for what? For Bush? Bush is a criminal. That's what he is. Yeah, it's definitely, you know, knowing a lot of people that I served with that never came back or a lot of people that are missing legs or arms and stuff like that we you know when when that whole thing happened 2001 i was i was in high school i was a freshman in high school right so more than half of my life is just believing that you know these people in another country they would have never met they don't have no idea what's going on here in the, in the u.s that they hate us just because what they they can't they can't build a mcdonald's where they live or they don't have any Grocery stores, there's no Walmarts, you know, so they just hate it, you know, what we have when in reality. Yeah, when in reality, when in <laughs> reality, it's us who kept them like that. Like that. Yep. So the, the hate could grow. It was a group called the Project for the New American Century, PNAC, which is a quasi Masonic think tank that was founded in 1997 by William Crystal and Robert Kagan which dissolved in 2017, which was behind all this. And all the neocon people were part of it. So you had Jeb Bush, Samuel Huntington, Donald Kagan, Douglas Feet, Dick Cheney, Donald, uh, Donald Ramsfield, Irving Crystal, Dan Quayle, Paul Bovowitz, uh, Richard Perl, Carl Rove, Bill Ben. These people are all crooks. And if Americans have been fooled by these people once, 
They can't be fooled twice. That's why Donald J. Trump is the president that breaks with the neocon past of the Republican Party, regenerates this party. I'm not saying he's the perfect man. I mean, there's no perfect, perfect politician, even if he wasn't a politician before. But definitely, I like him because he wasn't a politician, because he wasn't involved with all these think tanks and these crooks, because he might have a past of gambling his uh, uh, businesses uh, and doing things that are eccentric in a way or... But, I mean, he managed to become a rich man doing business. Business is not always a straight path, let's say. Okay. <laughs> so, but these people instead are criminals. These people make business with, with their lives, with selling to the military industrial complex and to the big pharma. Because all the soldiers that have that come back from these terrible wars, of course, are on meds that are sold by the big pharma. And that's yeah. another and and, and the and the and the military industrial complex has made money with the weapons that they have produced for these wars. Yeah. And the and, and, and so here we are uh, with a guy who is uh, uh, criticizing of course he's criticizing Donald J. Trump or George W. Bush because he's a crook. And he's no better than Bill Clinton or better than Obama. No, Obama is Obama is the Out epitome of, uh, of of evil. I mean, this guy is, is 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 the father of ISIS, like Trump said, the father. Meaning, he went to Egypt, delivered his idiotic speech, and then <laughs> he went and met the same guy that Bush met that we talked before. The prince from Saudi Arabia, and then he founded basically ISIS. That's it. That's the story of ISIS. Right. Well, I, I was very aware of of you know I was in the military when Obama was in office, so um, the level of you know rules of engagement that we were expected to follow were just unbelievable. Like being fired upon and you, you couldn't fire back unless you were fired upon. And then you couldn't have your magazine and your rifle while you were carrying it. And then you couldn't have rounds in the magazine and you couldn't have anything un until you were fired upon, which makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Right. So like the level of it's like, of like get, get, kill to... me, I go yeah. out with, with, with a machine gun with no bullets. I mean, come on, man, I, this is yeah. ridiculous. It was, it was like everything was set up against us while i was there on purpose because they didn't want us firing back on them like killing anybody out there unless you were fired upon and even then you had to kind of determine whether your life was at risk like in a serious kind of way before any kind of rules of engagement could be taken and it was like a big mess like yeah it was it was the wildest thing that i like well we it was basically <laughs> the last phase of what was triggered by 9 11 and because they wanted you to lose they implemented these rules because eventually, as we know, America abandoned Afghanistan. America abandoned before that Iraq, left with a little force in Iraq. But nowadays, Iraq is basically allied with Iran, which, which, which really, after all these decades of sacrificing, uh, uh, sacrificing our soldiers for, 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 for what? For, so that Iraq can mingle with Iran. And Iran is behind the, the jihadism because they were the ones that in the 60s and 70s, when there was still the Pavlavi Shah there and they were about to overthrow him in 1979, in the universities here in the West, we had, of course, the Red Book of Mao, all these idiots, leftists and stuff. In the Middle East, this mix was mixed of this leftism with Islamic, Islamo-communism, a monstruosity, which then manifested with Ayatollah Khomeini and the Republic of Iran. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is incredible that people in the universities here are, are, are doing what they're doing today because we have sacrificed lives for what? The biggest thing that, that confuses me, well, not confuses me, I guess, but in... In their eyes, I guess, like the students and all the leftists, for, I guess, in the guise of acceptance and like trying not to hurt people's feelings, 
and everybody needs to be equal and accepted and all these things that they would side with Islam is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my entire life. People that are homosexuals and people that are... Yeah, that's they will last five minutes in Gaza and they will be killed. It's a the most ridiculous thing. will last thing. five minutes, maybe two minutes, and then he will be run over by uh, by somebody. I mean, it, it's like it's like these people are insane because all their values that they're trying to defend are actually condemned by Islam. Right. So it doesn't make any sense. Absolutely no sense. I mean, I've seen, you know, they, a lot of people have gone to like Palestine and places like this and asked them to their face, like, do you support homosexuals? Do you support, you know, gay rights and all these kinds of things? And then the people there are just looking at them like, no, like we don't support any of that kind of stuff. That's against what we believe in and, and all these things. And you can show these people this exact same video and they just wouldn't, it wouldn't click in their mind that, 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 that that's real. It's either that's fake or that's propaganda or you guys are just trying to put us against or put them against us. It's like, come on guys. Like it's one, one Google search is all you need to do to figure out that, that, that they hang gay people, like in the town squares, they shoot them, throw them off buildings. Women them and what they do to women, what they do to yeah. women in Iran or in other countries in the Middle East. I mean, come on guys. <laughs> it's insane. It is insane. I mean, I, the, and then these women, I saw the same women that maybe from Iran or from Turkey or from other parts or, or the Middle East going into the Western universities and then they were all kind of playing the socialist card, yeah. the leftist card, when in reality, if you bring them back to their country of origins and they did the same thing, well, they will not survive it. They will not survive it. And we know that that happens almost weekly in Iran that women get arrested because they don't respect these hideous rules. So, sure. yeah, I it's... think that we need to 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 be more honest uh, with ourselves and also have uh, professors that are honest in these universities. But unfortunately, there is no honesty because they're all uh, tools uh, of this uh, demented ideology that uh, is mixing things that don't even fit with each other. But in any case, the millennial guy just goes along with it for the ride. <laughs> I don't know. There's not, know. Much, there's not much of a, a pushback, which is unfortunate. I, even if there is a pushback, I mean, the people on, on those sides that, that, that believe, you know, all these things we've been talking about, like, they're a minority in the country, but they speak the loudest, right? They're threatening people, trying to get them fired from their job, trying to ruin their lives. So a lot of people are scared of that kind of stuff. And I understand, you know, a lot of people, just, they just can't afford to go through that kind of stuff. But at some point, it's going to have to be, there's going to have to be a point where people just have to stand up and just be like, hey, what you guys believe and what you're saying is just not true. Like, we always hear this term that you get from the left side that, that people on the right or wherever, like in the middle are on the wrong side of history, which is like the weirdest thing that I've ever heard coming from anybody on, on the left side. They'll say, you know, you don't believe in gay rights and women's rights and all these kinds of things. And you support Trump and all this crap. You're on the wrong side of history. Trump, like, Trump is always just tolerant with everything. I mean, yeah, just, yeah. Uh, just see the history of Trump. He went out with black women. He, he was doing parties with, the, with gays in New York. He plays YMCA as the new... Guys, come on. He's playing YMCA. I mean, you don't need to be a scientist to understand that this song by the village people is the most camp song in the history of campness. So, I mean, the guy is definitely open-minded and, and, and Republicans have always been tolerant uh, as long as they can carry on also their conservative uh, tradition within their own family. So here is about people who are creating a false narrative of white supremacists, because that is always comes in, the white supremacist element. Right. Not gonna, okay? uh, but it is a false narrative, absolutely. And, and we need to, 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 to realize that if they will force another term of Joe Biden in this country, 
I'm sorry, but we will see a civil war. This is uh, what's going to happen because at one point there is going to be half of the country, more than half of the country that uh, that wants Trump to to come back, to go back into the White House, to put some uh, law and order back in this country. Uh, they will be so pissed off. They will not be able to live uh, any longer in, in, in this situation whereby we, we are spending a lot more money when we go for groceries, a lot more money we go to the gas station, and, and, we, and we are not capable of, of purchasing any longer a home or building a future. We can't even put any money aside because we have to live from check to check. So this is really the, uh, the fragile economic reality that uh, Biden has established, as, as also the whole thing with the immigration. Now Biden is trying to uh, change things at the last minute because he knows that he's losing all the votes of all the people on the border. And that starts in California and it gets through and it's all the way to Texas. There's no well, town there's... on the border that will vote for this insanity with what is happening. So <laughs> he's trying to uh, change things. But it's way too late, and plus nobody's believing. And also, actually, what is happening here is quite funny because he's changing, and of course, uh, his progressive allies within the Democratic Party, the party are disappointed with him. So he's mm-hmm. making people disappointing uh, on all sides, and he's and, and and he can only win with trickery. But let's not say more because the algorithms also are forcibly. <laughs> imposing censorship, another thing which, of course, is courtesy of the Biden administration and his friends in Silicon Valley. Well, what's interesting, I mean, so I was born on the border. I'm originally from El Paso, so it's right on the border between New Mexico, Texas, and Mexico. So we have a little triangle there. And and so I'm originally from there. Um, But I've seen, since I was a little kid, people coming over the border. I lived like on the border, like maybe a hundred yards away from the border, from the border wall. That's, that's where I used to live. Um, so people coming over, over the border every day for school and then they'd go back and then people would just sneak over the border all the time. So that's a whole dynamic. It's starting to get worse now from. Well, you see, for so example, Biden, Biden now wants to stop the immigration suddenly, but in reality, he's not really stopping. He's going to, give the possibility to, to find some 500 migrants a day rather than 4,000 to come in. Well, I mean, it's still a lot of people. And, and so he, he's not really doing that much. He's just trying to grasp. I mean, he wants to grasp the boat, get the boats of the people on the board. That's what he's doing. I think that the only thing, where, yeah, the only thing that really bothers me is that illegals which is what we should call them a lot of people call them undocumented migrants and they're illegal they, they're not here legally there's no listen the legal part is legal, hard. Yeah. the legal part uh, is hard but it's the, what i did it's a hard path right. you have yeah. to have patience you have to go Money. through a lot of bureaucracy yeah. and, and 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 you have to sacrifice years of your life for it right and then these people come through the board and they're, they're given everything just because Biden wants them to vote for him. I mean, this is insane and it's not permissible any longer. So I hope that things change, but I also hope that people understand that we are uh, at a turning point in history where, of course, there is also the war in uh, Ukraine. There is the Middle East that might uh, expand and it become the pulsating heart of this third world war, which is already in place. Right. And 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 you see, it happens when uh, politicians lose control of their country. Evil politicians, what they naturally do is always send people at war. So that's the big problem here. Will we be able to at least see? Uh, Biden out of the White House before something like this manifests because then, you know, then we will see instead suddenly a war expanding. We will see people called forcibly from their homes at 18 years of age to go and fight useless wars. I hope not. I personally hope not. 
Ukraine is definitely the biggest money laundering operation I've ever seen in my life. But, um, you know, like we're talking about the illegals, but even here in the States, so obviously they're all coming in. Los Angeles uh, Police Department is now hiring illegals, so giving them a badge and a gun. Colorado is trying to do the same thing. Chicago is doing the same thing as well, trying to make them police officers, um, which is like the craziest thing in the world. Obviously, when your population doesn't want to go to war or follow the rules that you do, you bring in people that will, that have no connection to the country, and they have no will to... Yeah, that, that's what yeah. happening already in Europe. When Greece was getting out of control, they were bringing in forces from Germany. And, and, and Europe is a very, up until the establishment of this monstrosity called the European Union, Europe was very divided. They, they, they fought wars against each other until the Second World War. And now instead, when Greece went into a deep crisis, they started to bring police forces from Germany because, like you said, they had no connection with the people from there, but they had to reestablish order for, on behalf of, of this technocrat monstrosity, which is in Brussels. So uh, the same thing, like you said, could happen also here. You just employ people that come here from abroad. They don't have really a American root. They don't believe in American values. They are only here because somebody let them in. So I hope that things will definitely change. But having said that, uh, it was a pleasure to be on your show. And of course, Volume 10 of My Confession is a book that uh, uh, people need to read to understand better uh, why this eternal conflict in the Middle East, unfortunately, is not going to stop anytime soon. Might actually expand. And at the same time, of course, uh, I explained in volume nine of my confessions uh, the war in Ukraine and how this Ukrainian identity was created artificially because uh, there were no Ukrainian people until 150 years, uh, 160 years, uh, 70 years ago. There was no Ukrainian people. They didn't exist. It is uh, a, a border territory which belonged partly to Poland, partly to Russia, which kind of like it's known actually the, 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 as a border territory. And then suddenly the Illuminati, the Freemasons, built this identity, especially uh, because Germany in particular wanted to play them then against Russia. So you see, it's always about manipulating and playing people against other people and then creating identities that are not even there. So nowadays uh, we have a country that definitely should be still under the influence of Russia, because historically it's connected to Russia. Instead, they have eliminated all the Orthodox Church connections with Russia. They have actually closed down monasteries, arrested priests. They have done things that are out of this world. They have even changed the uh, Christmas from the Orthodox date to, the, to our 25th of December, which is, of course, connected to our tradition, not their tradition. So so all this to give more and more money to a corrupt crook who used to be an actor and of course was financed by Soros for years in establishing himself as a comedian but now of course he's not letting us laugh anymore he's actually uh, going around always asking for money more money and, and and this guy is worried of course he's worried he knows that if Trump goes into the White House this guy is going to last 24 hours he's going to be found murdered on the side of the street this is gonna gonna. This is what's gonna happen to Volodymyr Zelensky if Trump goes back. Not because Trump wants to kill him, but simply because their his own people will kill him. Right. Once he doesn't have anything to offer. Well, there's no more men in the Ukraine. They're all dead. They're yeah, all dead. and that's also another big problem because, as, as I said a moment ago, they will end up with the conscription, with bringing people from Europe and then from America to fight a war that will bring us against Russia and that will be inevitably a nuclear war. I mean, you can fantasize about invading Russia, but the reality is that they have more nuclear weapons than us. So just forget about it. Plus, they have hypersonic missiles, which still here, I mean, China has hypersonic mission, missiles. Uh, Kim Jong-un has hypersonic mission. Uh, Russia's hypersonic mission, missiles, and here in America we are still trying to make experiments to see if they work because we're not sure 
I mean, come on, man, even sonic missiles are the future and you still don't have an arsenal of... That's insane. That, that is something I don't understand. Uh, I will be investing money not on uh, uh, some kind of uh, uh, monthly uh, pride uh, that goes in eternal uh, loop, but rather, and, and in all, of course, the army forces that have to embrace uh, all this gender bullshit. But I will be investing in hypersonic missiles because that is the future. And if we don't have them, we are behind. Right. That is a fact. Yes, That's sir. So, yes, sir. Well, Mr. Zagami, I won't take up too much of your time anymore. I appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to chat with us today. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, everybody, you, know, you can find your book on Amazon as well. Um, yes, and uh, leozagami.com. You will find also my latest articles and, of course, the links to the book. Uh, thank you so much for having me on. I hope to speak also to you in the future. We already sp spoke in the past. So, we, we have established a connection there. I hope uh, that your viewership grows and I hope uh, that uh, your viewers understand the importance of a book uh, that wants to finally uh, bring you also the truth about a reality that is not known in this country like Islamic Freemasonry and Islamic Illuminati. So thank you for giving me this possibility today because the great servicemen and women of this country deserve more. And uh, I hope uh, they also understand uh, the importance of uh, finally revealing certain secrets to have a better awareness so yeah. when the military industrial complex create the next 9 11 we can say sorry we're not gonna fall for this bs yeah. you can go and fight your war on your own with your drones and your ai having said that that's the future unfortunately of the world because in the end they, 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 they we will probably see in in a few decades an army of robots fighting rather than humans and that's gonna be really something that we should fear even more yeah, absolutely. It's going to be crazy. Well, we actually, um, over the next few months, it's going to be a little nail biting. Hopefully we get through the next election pretty well, but I appreciate your time. I hope Thank and I you. pray for continued success for you and I appreciate Thank you very much. Thank you. God bless America. Thank you, sir. Well, everybody, I uh, appreciate you guys stopping in once again. Um, that was Leo Zagami there. Like I mentioned, we had him on in episode 10, um, it's been a while since you know he's been back on, but he's very busy, obviously moving here to the states and all that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, you can go back and check out that first episode we did, episode ten. Like I mentioned before, we've been being heavily censored lately over the past few weeks. Um, I had a lot of show ideas and topics that I was going to be doing shows on um, over the last couple of weeks, but I just found that a lot of our shows have been removed from YouTube. Um, I didn't get any kind of warning that they were going to be taken down. I got a warning for one of them, I think. Um, it was, I think, our first episode with Charlie Robinson. They sent me a post or they sent me an email saying that they were going to be removing it for community guidelines or whatever was going on. Um, so I had thought that it was just going to be that one only. But then I went back like a couple of days later and there was like six more episodes missing. So. All the all the Charlie Robinson episodes, uh, the James Corbin episode about 9/11, um, the episodes with Bishop Larry Gators as well, um, all gone from YouTube. So if you want to check those out, you guys can find those on Spotify and Rumble as well um, at Truth Defender Podcast. It's still up there. So anything that goes missing here, or whether we get taken down from YouTube or whatever over the next couple months till the elections, you can find us on Spotify and Rumble. So hopefully it doesn't happen. Finally got the Facebook up and running, so I'll have all the links to everything, including uh, Mr. Zagami's books and websites in the show notes down below. Um, yeah, so this episode we did live. Um, as per usual, you guys know that once we do these lives, they get deleted from the platform and then we re-upload them, edited, and ready to go. So um, maybe like an hour if you want to go back and watch it again, an hour, hour and a half, we'll have that back up and running. But appreciate you guys taking the time on a busy Tuesday. I know everybody was kind of on their way home from work or whatever was going on. Um, but yeah, once again, if you guys aren't already a subscriber, please consider hitting that subscribe button for us. Um, hit that like button as well. It really helps us out with the algorithms. Um, also, don't forget to hit the bell icon as well so you don't miss an episode in the future. Uh, if you guys are on the go and want to check us out, you can always find us on Spotify. Google, I think, is going away. Google Podcasts, so that probably won't be there again in a couple of months. Um, I don't know what they're doing. I guess they're taking that down. So Google's going down, uh, Apple Podcasts.
This is still up, iHeartRadio and Amazon Music at Truth Defender Podcast. Uh, if you guys enjoy what we do here on the show and you are feeling generous, please consider sharing the show with a friend, family member, or colleague. Questions for myself or our guests, as well as guests or topic recommendations, you can always shoot those over to our email at thetruthdefender1776 at gmail.com. Uh, social media and everything will be linked down below. We appreciate you guys once again. We'll be back with another episode towards the end of the week, I think. I think that's in the works, but appreciate you guys nonetheless. Um, have yourself a great rest of the week. Stay safe out there. Most of all, stay frosty. Perfect.